Uh, <clears throat> Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I are pleased to be here to answer your questions about today's interest rate announcement and our monetary policy report. Uh, before turning to your questions, I'll offer some insight into Governing Council's deliberations. Now, not surprisingly, the worsening global situation was the primary issue. Economic forecasts have been marked down further in most countries, largely as a consequence of the escalation of trade actions and uncertainty around what may be next. Heightened uncertainty about future trade policies is directly reducing business investment, and there is a risk that this will spread to households as well. Now, these consequences can be buffered through easier monetary policy, and many central banks have recently eased in response. However, we need to remember that tariffs and trade restrictions will work over time to permanently reduce potential output everywhere, while raising the prices of consumer goods, a stagflationary scenario. Monetary policy can only do so much about these elements of the shock. Le Canada n'est pas à l'abri de ces évolutions mondiales. En effet, le Canada a été un des premiers pays à sentir les effets de l'incertitude liée aux politiques commerciales, puisque l'ALENA a été la première cible de l'administration Trump. Cette incertitude pèse sur les investissements au Canada depuis trois ans. Ces vents contraires ont empêché les taux d'intérêt canadiens d'augmenter autant que les taux américains en 2017 et 2018. Cela dit, alors que d'autres économies subissent de plus en plus les, les conséquences de la guerre commerciale, une deuxième série d'effets vient toucher le Canada. On voit nos exportations et les prix de nos produits de baisse baisser. In today's updated projections, we are forecasting both exports and business investment to contract in the second half of this year and to recover only moderately in the next two years. We can see a wide range of indicators pointing to these effects in manufacturing, in mining, in rail transportation, in our business outlook survey, and in the quarterly reports of bellwether global companies. While we've had these secondary effects in our forecast for some time and have increased them in our latest projection, these are mostly judgment-based and the situation could worsen. Accordingly, we present a deeper analysis of this downside risk in today's MPR in Box 3. Now, let me just note that the biggest effect for Canada of a more negative global growth scenario would be a steeper drop in commodity prices and, as in 2015, a significant depreciation of the Canadian dollar. In contrast to these adverse global developments, the Canadian economy is demonstrating resilience overall. L'économie continue de créer des emplois à un rythme solide. Le taux de chômage est près de son creux historique. Beaucoup d'entreprises disent souffrir d'une grave pénurie de main d'œuvre qualifiée. Et la croissance des salaires a augmenté sensiblement ces six derniers mois d'environ. Après s'être ajusté au changement apporté aux politiques de logement entre 2016 et 2018, le marché de l'habitation se redresse clairement. Ce marché est encore alimenté par des taux d'immigration relativement élevés. Enfin, les dépenses de consommation ont assez bien résisté en moyenne. Et ce, grâce au solide marché du travail et au bas taux d'intérêt, même si le taux d'épargne augmente légèrement. At the same time, energy-producing regions continue to struggle as the full adjustment to the decline in oil prices back in 2015 is not yet complete, and transportation constraints are making the situation worse. You may recall that back in 2015, we said that the full adjustment would take up to five years that even with lower interest rates and a lower dollar, as well as fiscal stimulus, the adjustment to such a large shock takes a long time. It's painful for individuals, as it involves extended layoffs and possibly interprovincial migration, which is costly for all concerned. 
All this adds up to a complex outlook for Canada with considerable variation across regions and sectors. The strong labour market points to sources of growth such as information technology and other professional services, tourism, education, healthcare, financial services. Some of this growth is being offset by negative effects coming through business investment and exports, particularly in manufacturing and in the resource sector. On the whole, however, it appears that our economy is still operating close to capacity, but probably with a modest amount of excess supply. The Governing Council agreed that, all things considered, this excess supply is probably not pervasive. Furthermore, our situation differs from many other countries in that inflation is at our 2% target today and projected to remain very close to target despite the presence of modest excess supply. However, we acknowledge the downside risks as set out in our, our alternative scenario in Box 3. Governing Council also devoted some time to a discussion of the evolution of financial vulnerabilities in Canada. We've been encouraged by developments since the enhancement of the mortgage stress test, as there has been a significant decline in new mortgages above 450% of disposable income. Further, we have not seen evidence of froth in major housing markets for some time now. However, the recent strength in many housing markets across the country is a reminder that we will be carrying high levels of debt for a long time, despite a constructive evolution of vulnerabilities. So it is with this context in mind that the Governing Council considered whether the downside risks to the Canadian economy were sufficient at this time to warrant a more accommodative monetary policy as a form of insurance against those risks. And we concluded that they were not. In this setting, we discussed whether such insurance may come at a cost in the form of higher financial vulnerabilities and possible consequences for the economy and inflation in the future. Now, we agreed that the new mortgage rules in place limit this cost but the situation will require continuous monitoring. Moreover, the fact that inflation has been on target and is projected to remain near target means that we can weigh the upside and the downside risks to inflation more symmetrically. The Conseil de Direction est conscient que la résilience de l'économie canadienne sera de plus en plus mise à l'épreuve en raison des conflits commerciaux et de l'incertitude persistante. Au moment de considérer la trajectoire appropriée de la politique monétaire, nous allons surveiller dans quelle mesure le ralentissement mondial se propage au-delà de la fabrication et de l'investissement. Governing Council is mindful that the resilience of Canada's economy will be increasingly tested as trade conflicts and uncertainty persist. In considering the appropriate path for monetary policy, we'll be monitoring the extent to which the global slowdown spreads beyond manufacturing and investment. In this context, we'll pay close attention to the sources of resilience in the Canadian economy, notably consumer spending and housing activity. We'll also be watching for any changes to fiscal policy at the federal level now that the election is behind us. And with that, Senior Deputy Governor Wilkins and I will be happy to take your questions. All right. We'll start the question period. As usual, please, uh, one question, one follow-up. Kelsey Johnson, Reuters. Hello, Governor. <coughs> Deputy Governor. Um, Kelsey Johnson with Reuters. Uh, so with growth running below potential for both this year and next year, how close is the bank to cutting rates? Well, I, don't, I can't uh, summarize it any better than I just did. Um, we, we estimate that given the, uh, the growth slowdown that we have right at this moment uh, in the second half of the year, uh, that we're opening up a, a modest output gap somewhere between zero and one percent. The middle of that range, say 0.5 percent, is the, the kind of the point estimate. Um, that is, uh, you know, it's not something to be ignored, especially if more downside risks appear. Uh, but in this context, with our forecast still keeping inflation very close to 2 percent, like a uh, tenth or two out of, the, out of the line here and there, it's, it's a very minor kind of uh, development on the inflation front. 
So that puts us in a position to be able to weigh, weigh the risks in their totality. And as I said in my opening remarks, uh, to not take out an insurance cut, as, as some have called it, uh, in this setting, given that we are there and that there would be costs associated with that. As a follow-up, um, how has the outcome of the election with the minority government factored into the bank's decision? Is the bank considering that in any way or is there any concern around that? Well, that uh, makes no difference to our analysis uh, here at all. Uh, of course, uh, we act completely independently with our mandate, and it's all about what's the inflation forecast. And that is why I mentioned at the end uh, that uh, if the fiscal line in our, in our forecast changes because of, uh, you know, in the post-election period, then that would be one thing that would need to be taken into account the next time we do a forecast. Greg Quinn, uh, Market News International. Good morning. Uh, you're perhaps a bit of a loner now in the G7 with a higher rate than those other nations, and, and Canada's economy long thought to be a, a trade-dependent economy. What is it that's able to, to carry us through a, a global trade war? Well, we've made it clear, I think, both in the uh, statement and the monetary policy report that uh, we are we are not an island. Uh, you know, we are not immune to these global developments, but we think we're in a good position to cope with whatever comes our way, given that inflation is on target and unemployment is near an all-time low. Um, you know, healthy and fit people can still get sick, but they recover more quickly uh, when they do. And I just kind of characterize the Canadian economy as on, you know, overall in that situation. Uh, allowing for the fact that it's not universal. There are, of course, as I mentioned, uh, significant regional and sectoral differences across, across the economy. Uh, but in that uh, context, uh, I think we, we, you know, we are in a, in a global setting where, in fact, you know, many of our borrowing rates have gone down with, with global interest rates through, through the bond, global bond market. And so we are benefiting from that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, e easier conditions for people renewing their mortgages and, in fact, uh, negotiating new mortgages. Uh, so that's, that's already a factor which is a consequence of that, uh, of that trade war and is influencing things. It also reminds you that, um, you know, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of talk about divergence, but actually what has occurred is more of a convergence. That is, inter U.S. interest rates have come down to uh, about the same as our levels. Uh, uh, because they went up farther in the first place. Uh, so I would say we are kind of converged in this situation right now, and our outlook for the two economies is not that different. Uh, secondly, um, is, is the current rate still providing stimulus to the Canadian economy, given this outlook? Well, absolutely. Uh, there's substantial monetary stimulus uh, in the system. Uh, and that, of course, has been a factor for, for a long time. So as we've said for, well, literally years, we, there, are, there are headwinds pushing against the Canadian economy. And until those headwinds uh, dissipate, you won't see a return of all policy parameters back to what we call normal or, you know, non-stimulative levels. Um, we did think we were getting pretty close, you know, uh, previously, but then, of course, we had the trade war and, and as well some more uh, some more issues with the uh, with uh, with the oil markets and uh, another shock from that source. So in that context, we're throwing a little bit again off track. Uh, but again, the forces that are that are pushing us back to normal are are still there. But against them are these uh, these forces coming from outside uh, the, the trade war. Kevin Carmichael, Financial Post. Good morning, uh, Kevin Carmichael, Financial Post. Uh, both of you have talked about uh, getting a good policy mix for years now. Uh, others in the global context seem to have caught up where, where you've been um, uh, starting a few years ago, at least. Um, that makes me wonder, if, uh, given the current setting, that fiscal policy would uh, be helpful for, uh, for you going forward. If, could you, would, would Canada benefit from fiscal stimulus at this stage? Well, based on our, our meetings in uh, Washington last week, that's almost a global uh, statement that you just made, that uh, 
that uh, there's a growing concern that monetary policy has, has done mo most of what it's able to do um, and that the shock that we're all facing is one that everybody is, sh is sharing. Perhaps you'd like to talk about the, uh, the fiscal side and how it works in. Sure. Uh, well, you know very well, and I think we've said for a long time, we just take fiscal policy as given. Um, but it's in, it's in a very important given, and of course, whether it's a provincial budget or a federal a federal budget, uh, those announcements can change the bottom line in terms of growth. You'll notice that in in the current outlook, the contribution from government goes from about 0.7 in in 2018 down to 0.2 for for 2020 and 2021, and so it can really move things, and that's why we watch it so closely. It has implications for the outlook and therefore for monetary policy. I think when we when we when we you know make our adjustments to the outlook, we also look at what else has changed over time. So it's never a all else being equal situation and so we'll have to see what uh, what comes uh, with the new government and uh, and uh, alter our outlook uh, in consequence uh, my second question relates to the exchange rate have you observed that the uh, the strength of the Canadian dollar is uh, is hurting the competitiveness of uh, Canadian exporters well uh it's, uh, it's really, the, the Canadian dollar has been relatively stable uh, in its primary uh, exchange, which again is the U.S. dollar. It's in a, been in a pretty narrow range, slightly higher than it was uh, a year or so ago. But, uh, but the main thing that's happened is the U.S. dollar has been strong globally. And so while we've been fairly steady with the U.S., we've been appreciating against a lot of other currencies. And so it's on those margins where, uh, where people are mentioning, well, it's a little harder to, uh, to compete. Uh, we do know that, um, you know, we're, you know, as, as it says here, we expect uh, exports to actually go down uh, during the second half of this year. Uh, it's sort of an extraordinarily strong uh, Q2, and so the average for the year still looks, sort of, you know, I was going to say respectable, but I got to say it's it's a little a little a little soft, but at least positive. Uh, so um, my sense is that um, it, it can bite on certain margins, uh, but uh, as far as the the competitiveness across the U.S. is when most of the conversations go to other things than the exchange rate, uh, you know, the sort of impediments or you know trade impediments or red tape or uh, or those those kinds of other cost factors. Uh, Globe and Mail. Uh, Dave Parkinson of the Globe and Mail. Um, notice the, the the summary graph of the uh, paragraph of the statement uh, dropped the, the use of the the phrase that we are close to potential. Um, just wondering. I know that we don't like to hang ourselves too much on on turns of phrase, but obviously the market picks up on uh, on changes of language. Um, wondering what the reasoning is to no longer include um, in the statement. Uh, in the statement summary that, that we believe the economy to be close to potential and uh, what's the reasoning for dropping that and also the significance? Well, I, th I think you just, just proved prove my contention that it's best not to say the same thing every time uh, because uh, it means that people do get hung up on terms and whether they're there or not there each time. So as I think I've told you many times, we start with a blank page and uh, tell a new story based on the new data and what we've observed and what our deliberations were about. I did mention in my opening statement that we are close to potential. We, uh, we think it's uh, somewhere between zero and one percent of uh, excess supply. Uh, the point estimate is very close to 0.5, or we say minus 0.5 to be exact, uh, which is, I would say, it's not uh, something to be dismissed, okay? It's, it's clear that uh, uh, we we have moved in that direction. The question is, does it does it continue beyond that? You know, so that's why we say we have to monitor the sources of strength, the sources of resilience in the economy, and make sure that uh, they hold up. Um, and uh, of course, it's always possible that we'll get some positive news on the trade front, which would be uh, you know, which would give us some sort of a bounce in things like investment and exports. So. Um, you know, I would say, I think, uh, I don't know, you read the newspaper as much as I do. Uh, uh, what, what odds are there that Kuzma or USMCA gets ratified 
in the near term and that's those odds are higher today than they were before it looks like to me and uh, the, the prospect of a possible deal even if it's a phase one deal between the US and China I think would would cause you know uncertainty to stop rising if, if you like it's the sort of thing is the, it's the uncertainty path that's uh, causing most of the problems with uh, with investment while you're on the uh, the topic of um the possibility of a of a, a positive uh, turn on the trade front. Um, NPR obviously has a box that talks about about the downside risk. Um, there seems to be more emphasis on the downside risk here. You have talked in the past about a certain, uh, at least a degree of symmetry of the risk in, in on the trade front. Do you feel that we are now tilted more towards the uh, the downside than you previously felt? Um. Yes, uh, we are, if only because time has passed and the negatives are already there. So uh, we already can point to uh, significant damage being done to the global economy from the trade war. And so starting from there, as opposed to where we were, say, a year and a half ago, we were starting with, uh, you know, statements, rhetoric, uh, bluster, it, it, it could have been bargaining, it could be real, we didn't know. So. It was definitely two-sided then, and then as as the accumulated evidence uh, grows, uh, then you know you're starting from a negative position. So uh, sure, if the uncertainty goes away and uh, and you know everything kind of goes back more to normal, uh, then we'd expect to see a bounce. But it'll be be some time before we were to make up the level cost that's already been paid. So there is an asymmetry to it now, for sure. Um, the difference between July and now, the analysis in the box is, is pretty pretty important because in the box in July, we were analyzing a hypothetical uh, augment or escalation of the trade war. More tariffs on, on all sides. Uh, and uh, whereas what this box does is it holds tariffs and, and all the things, the actions that are put in place, holds them constant and simply analyzes the uncertainty channel, which as we said over and over, seems to be the one that's playing the biggest. And the way that takes uh, form is by companies feeling uncertain enough that they refuse to invest, spend money uh, uh, on, on growing their, their operations. Um, and so what we did was we reverse engineered uh, what, the, um, what the, the, roughly what the gap is between the Fed dot plot and what market expectations are, and converted that into how much more uncertainty must be playing out in the marketplace. As that's ma that's how the measure was created, and so that is how we scaled the shock. So that's why we call it a more, I say, realistic, if you like. It's not a purely hypothetical one. It's actually how much uncertainty market participants seem to have in their mind. And so we've run that through the models, and uh, we've come out back with, as you can see, a more dire scenario than our base case, um, and um, but one where you can see all the channels operating and how the how the economy would adjust to it. Toronto Star. Toronto Star. Um, so just pulling together a couple of the things that you mentioned in in, in your reports um, about Alberta and energy intensive economies. So I, th I think you're indicating that the, the, the Alberta budget you see it as uh, contractionary. Um, I, I, and at the same time, you've got some indications that you see a slow recovery in, in the Alberta economy. Does the, does the austerity that you see in the, in the um, budget come at uh, an appropriate time in that cycle in terms of you know, the, that, that economy needing some stimulus? Well, we did analyze the effect of the Alberta budget for the purposes of just seeing what it would do to the bottom line for growth in Canada, and I'm not going to make a comment about the timing or the appropriateness of any particular measures. What we do see, though, in, in Alberta is, is, um, is still quite an adjustment in the oil and gas sectors that, that the governor talked about that we knew was going to take a while, and then, of course, because of the transportation constraints uh, is... is um, a little bit more protracted than, than we had originally expected, say, in 2015. Uh, 
that being said, on the investment side, uh, we think that after the rest of the adjustments uh, finished this year, that next year, uh, because of new capacity coming online from Enbridge 3 and some other projects, uh, as well as finding a new level, that that investment should, should uh, stabilize at, at a newer level. And it's important to just understand how much adjustment has already been made. It used to be 30% of GDP that, uh, investment, and now it's 15%. So it's, it's quite a lot lower, but still an important part of investment in Canada. Um, you know, on the export side, again, uh, we expect from the non-energy point of view, or from the energy point of view, uh, that growth to continue, but, it, but at a modest pace. When you look at other parts of the Albertan economy, you do see the housing market still adjusting. You see on the labor side uh, that unemployment rate still relatively high, and uh, but at the same time, there's there's also signs of stabilizing. It's a pretty difficult adjustment, uh, but we're happy to see that at least on the wage side, that uh, wage growth picked up overall in Canada, and wage growth in those particular regions uh, has has also picked up to kind of meet the the Canadian average. Thanks. And just to, to follow up on, on the timing thing, more generally, um, if you uh, to go back to your comments to Kevin about the about the policy mix. So if 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 there's a need for stimulus and monetary policy is out of juice, when is the best time for 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 revving up the f the fiscal policy side of things? Well, I think from that that's a that's a important question, and I think it's it's uh, more more uh, interesting than just when monetary policy is out of juice because the mix of monetary and fiscal policy actually matters. Uh, all the time because when you stimulate the economy and you do it from the monetary policy side, what you're doing is you're stimulating credit growth and often household credit growth. Whereas when you're, when you're uh, using the government expenditures, it's on the government side. And so there's a choice there to be made about which pile of, of debt you want, you want to increase. And that's dependent on where you are in the economy. I think as well, there's, uh, it's, pretty widely accepted, at least in the global tables that, that we've been at, that, that fiscal policy uh, has more bang for its buck when interest rates are, are low, and, and particularly when interest rates have run out of juice, as, as you put it. And so those are all considerations, and they're ones that I think fiscal authority needs to take on their own because there are more objectives to fiscal policy than meeting uh, the joint inflation target agreement that we have. <coughs> Wall Street Journal. Hi, from the Wall Street Journal. Um, the, the statement talks uh, about the the importance of governing council paying close attention to sources of resilience, consumption, and housing. Um, I'm wondering, given the the past focus the bank has put on a rotation of the economy away from consumption and housing and toward exports and investment, um, where your view of that rotation currently stands is it? Um, is it on hold right now, given the global headwinds that, uh, that Canada is facing? So, um, yes, it's on hold. But what the, the good news is a bunch of that rotation actually occurred mm -hmm. back when we were talking about it. It's not as though it never occurred. Okay, it did. Um, so uh, if you just look at the, the charts in, uh, in levels, you know, of how exports uh, came back, uh, through that period and investment too, um, but we've had a, you know a series of interruptions of that process. You know, one the, the really big one being the oil shock in 2014-15. Um, you know, you all, almost to tell the story now, you have to take uh, energy sector investment and exports out of the chart and, and see what's going on in the rest of the economy because that is a, such a major adjustment that overshadows um, almost everything else. But if we, if, if we do that, what you see is plenty of signs that uh, the rotation has actually occurred and that it, that it continues. Um, but it would be fair to summarize it right now as a bit on hold because both investment and exports have, have slowed right down in light of the, of the trade war. Um, we, we are definitely, we're in a two-track economy, which we've talked about certain phases through, it almost always have some, some features of a two-track economy, but uh, 
Just uh, you know, a, a couple of quick numbers. Like the overall, right now, we think the economy is growing at say one and a half percent. Well, the service side of the economy is growing by 2.3 or 2.4 percent, uh, whereas the goods side of the economy is growing like is is growing negatively. Okay, so and that of course would include uh, the energy sector is an important part of that, but manufacturing, et cetera. So. Um, in, in terms of employment, it looks more balanced because uh, we continue to have job creation across a much wider spectrum. And, uh, you know, so over 2% growth in employment over the last year, which is, which is terrific, and 2.6% in, in services, 1.3% in goods. So, again, you can see the two tracks operating. And there's a fairly strong regional dimension to that as Carolyn has been mentioning. So we're aware of all those disparities. It's just that in the aggregate, it comes together roughly at potential, just a little bit uh, short of potential, and as I said, with inflation on target. And uh, you mentioned um, governing council discussed financial vulnerability. Yes. Um, and the impact of, if there were to be an insurance cut, the impact on um, worsening those vulnerabilities. Can you speak to to what extent um, concerns about financial vulnerabilities factored into the actual decision making? Well, as I said in my opening remarks, which is a, in effect a record of the things that we spent our time on in deliberating, it was a significant piece of the discussion. Um, we 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 do feel uh, that first of all, the new the new stress test and other uh, macroprudential uh, changes have served pretty well to kind of uh, get a situation uh, into a more normal uh, sort of behavior. Uh, and we were watching, as you know, for a while to see how disruptive that might be for the housing market. So the housing market, you know, had a weak, weak year or so, and, but it's coming back across the board. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, that's, all, that's all encouraging. Now, we, now it's important to remember, though, that those new macroprudential measures are a form of protection against future uh, over excessive enthusiasm. Okay, so so that, that of course, we, that's a little bit untested, right? Because it's kind of the first time we've gone into a housing recovery with those new measures in place. So uh, we'll have well, that's why we say we'll monitor that closely. Um, but no doubt that in today's macroprudential environment, the cost associated uh, with an, a, a so-called insurance rate cut would be lower than it would have been without those macroprudential things. So that's, that's, that's the base you start from. Uh, but we don't think it's zero or anything. You know, you, it's still possible, of course, to reignite a bunch of bidding wars and so on in the housing market because, as far as I know, not much has changed on the supply side. Uh, you know, but by having lower rates and uh, good income growth, there's good demand. And immigration, there's good demand uh, for housing. So it was, uh, was an important part of the discussion. And, uh, and in the end, we're, we're comfortable where we found that, that the overall risk balance, that's just not just managing inflation risk, but the financial stability risks at the same time. Any other questions? Yes. Can you press? Uh, sir, um, could you give us a sense of how close uh, you came this time to cutting rates. Uh, I don't know how to how to answer that, Andy. It's uh, I mean, we, we as I can you can tell from the previous exchange, we definitely talked about what what uh, that would look like, and it's true that uh, as an inflation targeter, you're looking forward, you're balancing the risks on the inflation outlook, and if the downside risks start to build up, that's when you start thinking that you know, gosh, we should anticipate. So, so far, as I said, we kind of have, we can clearly identify in the uh, exports and investment this drag coming from the trade side, but at the same time, we've got some pretty good left coming in other parts of the economy. And um, so that's, that's how those two things kind of tend to balance out for, for the time being until you see different data that, uh, that convince you otherwise. Um, on top of that, as I, I want to make everybody understand, we. We start that discussion with inflation on target. If inflation were below target, such as where we were back in 
then, and especially then when we had the downside shock from oil, the oil price collapse, we could, we could do the arithmetic around that shock. You know, we, we, ca we called a few companies, we knew how large that shock would be to the economy in dollars and how quickly it would affect. Whereas here, we're talking something very intangible. You know, how, how, how do companies adapt to this trade frustration or trade in, uh, uncertainty? Well, they don't usually just sit there. They, they, uh, they do things. And, and so, so you have to kind of read the data and see how it's going as opposed to just doing arithmetic. So with that much uncertainty, I think the, the, the best, uh, best solution here where we are is to uh, hold firm and watch things develop. And uh, as I said, because inflation's on target, it kind of gives you that ability to keep it symmetric. The fact that the federal election was only a few days before this scheduled announcement, did that play a factor at all? Perhaps because the bank was, was quiet over that period, of course? Well, you know, the, traditionally a bank, the central bank is usually quiet during an election period. I think that's, that only makes sense. It, uh, it avoids the avoids us getting dragged into the dialogue. I think that's, that's an important thing. Um, but uh, no, if the, obviously, if the situation warranted it, we would have acted today. Uh, or that would have been that would have been our preference to do. So, no, not, nothing like that. Yeah, Bloomberg. Hi, this is Shelley Nagy with Bloomberg News. Did the bank consider insurance cuts in September? Uh, well, in September we didn't have a whole new forecast. Uh, we had uh, we were of course. If, if you'd asked me in September, I would have, we could have guessed which way the forecast was shifting, mm -hmm. right? So, but, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to know, uh, to, unless a risk becomes obvious to you in that short time frame of six weeks, uh, you're more, more inclined to say, I, I need to understand this better before I know whether, you know, because as, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, like, it's not never just one thing that's changing. There's all kinds of things changing all at once, and so you want to to figure out the exact uh, proportion and what how the risks have tilted. Really does require us using all of our tools, and that's a that's a longer process. That's why we only do it every four 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 times a year, three uh, three every three months. So that's that's a big exercise, and uh, would be well, first of all, it'd be hard to do every time, but I think it would be kind of counterproductive because you actually need time to absorb new data and think about, to make form those judgments. It's not a mechanical exercise like pressing a button. So the direct answer to your question is no. We, we were, but certainly we could all see which way the winds were blowing, uh, that the, the, the risks were beginning to accumulate on the foreign side, yeah. To the forecast kind of made you consider this. So, so you get a new forecast in front of you, and uh, you can see then, and then plus that extra case that's in box three, kind of informs. Well, okay, so what would what would the world look like if say we're say the forecast is wrong and it's a bit worse than we than we thought? Well, that it's easy enough to imagine what it looks like if it's better, you know. Uh, but if it's if it were worse, then that box helps inform that. And I just just note that uh, actually in that that scenario, uh, inflation stays within the bands on that scenario. Okay, partly it's for an, an, an unfortunate reason, which is that aggregate supply goes down, as well as aggregate demand. So that if it was just demand going down, then there would be more downward pressure on inflation. But there's less pr downward pressure on inflation because of that stagflationary bit of the of the shock, because supply contracts permanently as well. Uh, so anyway, that's, that's exactly, that's a really complicated thing to do just on the back of an envelope. That's, that's why we need them, the tools all to be deployed and the whole staff rallies around it. Okay. Anybody else? I feel like I should toss in a question about Libra and stable coins since we've gotten through all the questions on, um, on the bank, on, on, on the state of the Canadian economy. Do you want to sort of update the Bank of Canada's view on, on Libra and uh, what appears to be um, a new urgency among global regulators about uh, getting a handle on uh, private stable coins? Well, sure. Um, I'm delighted to, uh, to remind you that we're a couple of years out ahead of that. So, uh, which is, and, and I happen to be sitting beside one of the world's foremost experts. So, uh, so over to you. So, uh, so 
it's interesting how exciting these developments can be. And you're talking specifically about labor, but there's a whole there's a whole class of crypto assets called stable coins, and that's part of that that asset class. And and what's exciting about it is the fact that these kinds of innovations can address what I think are important issues in the global payment systems, particularly the cost of cross-border payments. If you're trying to do a remittance, you're here and you want to send money to the Philippines, well, it costs a lot of money. Uh, if you're in another country, not so much Canada, but in others where you don't have access to a banking account, <coughs> you can't even make those payments. And so this idea of being more efficient and getting access is quite attractive. At the same time, we know that innovations never come without risk, and, and so when you balance that risk-reward, uh, you have to take some of the risks associated with these types of innovations, including Libra, pretty seriously. And that's what the G7 uh, did. You might have noticed there's a report that came out that Canada contributed to under the, the French presidency, which highlights the benefits, but also the costs that we all know that are related to money laundering and terrorist financing, but also uh, with respect to uh, safeguarding the value of that stable coin properly, as well as potentially uh, getting in the way of monetary sovereignty of different countries. And so it's for that reason that that report concluded that any kind of innovation of that type um, would have to and particularly that Libra would have to meet the regulatory requirements before it could go live. And, and uh, I think that makes sense in terms of uh, safeguarding, uh, I guess, the system not for central banks, but for citizens of, of our country. Now, at the same time, I think it has put a spotlight on, well, how did we get here with inefficient payment systems and ones where we don't have access? And that's put the onus on central banks and major participants and the international network to do something and quite quickly, uh, as quickly as they can, to address those issues. I think that work is going to be well underway. Uh, it's a priority uh, for, for the G7. I believe it will likely be for the G20 and the related groups at the BIS and the Financial Stability Board. And Canada will be right there uh, participating with it. Thank you. Thank you.